Stefan Heimersheim talk on cannibal dark matter. So with that, I would like to give him the floor. Yeah, so I want to use my four minutes to talk about uh, cannibals. Um, that's a, based on a project I submitted a few weeks ago together with Niels, uh, Diana and Julian. And cannibals is basically an, kind of a name for a class of dark matter particles that have number changing interactions. In particular, three to two interactions. So where kind of three particles interact, they kind of cannibalize one of them and the mass energy gets converted to, to heat and um, you get two particles remaining. And um, you might have heard this name already in Pranjar's talk, also about cannibal dark matter, although our models were kind of different and we get quite, uh, we have different results at the end. Um, so basically you just have some dark matter particle that um, does have a mass somewhere in the kilo electron volt to mega electron volt range. And we don't assume any um, interactions with standard models, so it's kind of a secluded uh, dark matter. And this leads to an interesting temperature evolution. So in the beginning, you just have, just like any particle, it behaves like radiation, where the temperature is much higher than the mass. But as soon as it gets non-relativistic, so that's kind of this, um, this point, the green re region in the plot, where the red line is the temperature over the mass. So that you see that the temperature then uh, gets constant. And this is because this three to two interaction is actually relevant. And all this mass that con gets converted to, to energy keeps the temperature almost constant. So it goes like one over log A. Um, and this continues until the um, interaction freezes out. So until the interaction rate is low enough. And then just behaves like cold dark matter because you don't have these interactions anymore. And what we did is implement this model into the Boltzmann Solver class and look what effect it has on the cosmic microwave background and on the meta power spectrum. And what I want to show you here is uh, the meta power spectrum. So what I have plotted here is the cannibals meta power spectrum divided by the meta power spectrum that you would get for lambda CN. And what you see on the large scales so on the left side is uh, that is the ratio is one, so there's no change, it's just the same spectrum. But on small scales on the right side, you see that you get a suppression. And this suppression depends on how much of dark matter is actually cannibalistic. So we just say we have some fraction of dark matter that can be cannibalistic, it can be everything, it can also be only a part. And you get the step in the power spectrum that depends on the interaction strength. So the stronger the interaction, the larger the scales that you suppress. And um, this, of course, uh, has in interesting, so it looks pretty much similar to warm or even hot dark matter. So we get similar suppression, but as opposed to these models, it's actually compatible with CMB while you get a nice suppression. So what I'll show you here is um, our MCMC results from using CMB and BAO constraints. And what you see on the y-axis here is the fraction of matter that's cannibalistic of dark matter. So at the top is one and the bottom is 10 to the minus two. And on the x-axis, the interaction strength from very weak on the left to strong on the right. And all the points are basically the kind of allowed parameter space. And you see, of course, on the left, you just have a really low interaction strength. So the freeze out is very early. And basically for all intents and purposes, you just have cold dark matter. But on the right, you have a strong, inter um, strong interaction and the cannabistic phase goes until today. And that's of course excluded. And the thing I want to point out is the color. So that's the S8 value. And you can see that close to kind of the boundary of the allowed region, you get a really low S8 value, actually close to the value that's preferred by the weak ending measurements. And that's still allowed, like sli only slightly kind of, it's still pre allowed by the CMB. Um, and the effect why these two boundaries are so close together is basically that the S8 value, you need, for the S8, you need the suppression to be on large scales enough that you affect S8. So if you have the interaction rate too weak, the suppression is on very small scales and you wouldn't notice that. While for the CMB, you need the freeze out to be late enough. And these two effects kind of counteract each other, which is why you have only this part in the middle where you get actually a low sigma eight compatible with CMB. Um, but you can get this. So you get a slightly, like a slightly worse CMB fit, but you can get <coughs> So that's kind of the take home message. And um, with cannibals, you can get S8 down to over <coughs> Um, okay. Great, thanks for your talk, Stefan. Um, so if there is more discussion, like if there are any questions, then encourage everyone to take up the discussion on Slack Apps at Local later. Yeah. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, give the floor to Bart Horn. Uh, Bart, can you share your screen? Will do. Is the sound okay? Mm -hmm. 
All right, here we go. Okay, um, so uh, hello everyone. I'm Bart Horn from Manhattan College. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for an excellent uh, conference and for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, observable relics from the Simple Harmonic Universe, which is a uh, paper that I uh, put out recently with uh, my student, Peter Gilmartin, also based on some previous work on the Simple Harmonic Universe with Graham Kashru, uh, Rajendran, and uh, Toroba. So the Simple Harmonic Universe is a model that we originally considered in the context of thinking about singularity theorems. Um, you can avoid the Big Bang singularity in the past um, if you violate the null energy condition with um, uh, flat or open spatial slices or uh, the, violating the strong energy condition if you have uh, closed spatial slices. So this specific model consists of closed or spherical spatial curvature, which uh, makes a negative contribution to the Friedman equation, um, a, a negative cosmological constant, and uh, an exotic matter source uh, with um, an intermediate equation of state between those two. And uh, if you plug these all into the Friedman equation, you can get a uh, scale factor that uh, is uh, periodic um, within the context of general relativity and null energy condition uh, preserving sources. Um, we showed in an earlier paper that uh, these can be made, this universe can be made stable at the level of linearized perturbations as long as the sound speed is uh, positive. And lately we've been thinking about what um, can happen if this tunnels or evolves into the present epoch. In particular, it suggests a number of uh, slightly unusual search templates, in particular, um, positive curvature, which is uh, somewhat less um, favored in the uh, uh, theoretical literature than negative curvature is. Um, this may or may not be uh, uh, accompanied by a string-like matter source that um, energetically cancels curvature out of the Friedman equation. And another signature that we looked for is a modified dark energy sector consisting of a cosmological constant that is negative today as well as, and that's over canceled by a uh, dark fluid with W slightly greater than minus one. So you can have a recollapsing dark energy sector. Um, we've searched for all these things using class and uh, Monty Python and various data sets. Unsurprisingly, what we have are constraints and not uh, discoveries, but um, what the constraints look like, um, positive curvature is constrained at about the percent level um, using the Planck data alone, there's a mild preference for uh, a closed slicing, which has been discussed uh, in a few recent works. Um, but if you add BAO data to that, um, the uh, error bars are still consistent with zero. It's also possible that uh, positive curvature can uh, suppress the uh, primordial quadrupole, um, essentially because the universe is uh, too large for that mode. And uh, we have some ideas in uh, model building on how that can be made consistent with um, the uh, non-detection of uh, curvature using the uh, position of the CMB peaks. Adding string-like matter changes the constraints on uh, the curvature parameter only very slightly, but this is still going to be important for the next generation of uh, experiments looking for curvature. And uh, finally, the uh, constraints on the modified dark energy sector can be uh, transformed into a bound on the lifetime of the universe. And uh, the experimental constraints imply the recollapse time is greater than at least about 30 Hubble times. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to discuss more either by email or uh, in the Slack chat if anyone has questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Bart, for the with a very interesting uh, talk. Then I would like to have a hand the floor to Luis Avenia Lopez. Um, Thanks. So, so if you can share your screen, then we can proceed. Okay, can you see my presentation now? Yes. Excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the organizer for this opportunity. Um, my name is Luis Ureña Lopez from University of Guanajuato in Mexico. Uh, I'm going to talk about the ultralight scale fields, story of three potentials. This work has been done in collaboration 
eh, eh, profesor Tonatio Matos, Dr. Alma González Morales, Stefano Medellín, and Francisco Linares. So you have heard just recently from these uh, ultralight bosons to explain uh, the nature of dark matter, but 20 years ago, uh, this idea uh, came up for the first time. And in this, in this slide, you can see uh, this famous fossil dark matter paper. They were thinking about uh, non-relativistic properties of ultralight uh, particles. But there were other ideas around uh, in which we were considering uh, the relativistic part of this model. And we were solving the Klein-Gordon equation uh, uh, for the cosmology. The simplest potential is the quadratic one, uh, which is the fuzzy dark matter uh, uh, case. But uh, I, I'm going to show you other possibilities which are uh, uh, more, uh, probably more interesting. The first one is the axion-like potential. Uh, you can see here that the functional form of the potential is a trigonom trigonometric cosine. And there is an extra parameter here, which is the axion decay constant, uh, this FA. Uh, but for the cosmology, the important parameter is this lambda that you can see here, which is a combination of the Planck mass with this axion decay constant. The uh, fossil dark matter case is recovered for lambda equals to zero, which means that the axion decay constant goes to infinity. Uh, like in the case of fossil dark matter, there is a suppression in the mass power spectrum, in the linear mass power spectrum, as you see in the uh, plot on the uh, lower left. And, but uh, there is, in addition, a bump in this mass power spectrum, an excess of power with respect to cold dark matter, uh, which is uh, uh, because of the presence of this extra parameter. So this extra parameter can help the model, can help fossil Sorry, dark matter. Uh, no. Lewis, if I may very briefly interrupt. Um, are you going through your uh, slides at the moment? Because we can only see the title slide. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I'm going to let me try again. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Can you, can you see my slides? Yes, the yes. Slides? Sorry about that. So uh, I was uh, talking about this action like potential. Uh, so uh, and, uh, this this uh, parameter, uh, this extra parameter in the potential can uh, help the fossil dark matter to uh, to be more consistent with constraints coming from Lyman alpha observations. For instance, uh, uh, we have uh, shown that in recent papers and also other people uh, in other groups. So. Uh, I'm going for the other case, which is the Koch-like potential. This time we have this uh, hyperbolic cosine. Again, there is an extra parameter here. Uh, and uh, as before, for the axon-like potential, there is this combination for this parameter lambda between the, the parameter and the uh, 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 Planck mass. This time, uh, there is uh, a suppression of power, which is very, uh, quite similar to the case of fossil dark matter. And there is no excess of power in the linear mass power spectrum. So uh, at that, uh, there is no difference between the fuzzy dark matter and the Koch-like potential. In addition, this, uh, this Koch-like potential uh, is going to contribute as an extra relativistic degree of freedom at early times. But if the mass of the boson is uh, large enough, uh, everything is consistent with constraints coming from planned observations. And, this suppression of power in the mass power spectrum was shown for the first time in, in, in a paper of ours 20 years ago, uh, but has been confirmed uh, for, uh, uh, in other works. Uh, if you go to the non-relativistic dynamics, this extra parameter, this lambda parameter, is going to show up as a quartic self-interaction in the Schrodinger equation, in the schrodinger poisson system of equations. And, you, uh, and this, is, this has consequences for the critical mass of gravitational collapse of these kind of models. I'm not going into the, deta into the details, but probably you can take a look at this slide uh, after the talk. But, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm finishing here. Uh, there are current constraints on the boson mass for these ultralight particles. You can see some of the most recent constraints on this, on this mass. Uh, the question is, uh, 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 where is the parameter lambda? Where is any other parameters in the model? 
These constraints only work for the for the boson mass for the Ponzi or matter case, but probably there is something else if we uh, consider an extra parameter in, in, in the potential. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. And, uh, thank you for the very interesting question. Um, then we can move on to now uh, on Trivedi. So, um, yeah, uh, so like firstly, is my slide visible? Like, is yes, my voice yes. audible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so firstly, I would like to thank the organizers uh, once again for giving me this opportunity. So, so today I will be telling a bit about my work on the Sonoplan conjectures and single field inflation. Uh, so, uh, so like it has been a famous problem in recent years that the Sonoplan conjectures have been shown uh, to be a bit, uh, uh, inconsistent with, with single field inflation or, or vice versa, it depends on you. Um, so um, uh, if it is the data conjecture or the distance conjecture or the, the newly proposed TCC, uh, all of them induce either fine tuning or severe uh, disagreements with single field inflation. But, uh, but multi-field models of, of inflation or, or the likes of warm inflation, even for the single field case, have been uh, shown to be uh, quite consistent with the, with the conjectures in certain limits. So it's not all who did for, for, for the conjectures and inflation. And it has also been shown uh, that in some general uh, cosmological uh, scenarios like chaotic inflation in the variable scenario, the single field inflation can be in good agreement with the conjectures. Uh, so, uh, so I used uh, the exact solution approach to inflation. So the exact solution approach to inflation is a very powerful method to study inflation in a range of different cosmologies. The, the generalized Friedman equation in this case is the follows um, and and this equation is quite general because uh, because one can uh, can study a range of cosmologies using this um, like uh, the churn simmons cosmology uh, or Greenwald cosmology even lqc um, so the equation is quite general um, and the epsilon uh, and slow uh, and the epsilon and and eta parameters uh, for this scenario uh, in the case uh, that that there is single field inflation are the follows uh, alongside the scalar spectral index uh, and obviously one can one can further consider more more perturbative analysis of the same um, now uh, the central points of contact between the conjectures um, and uh, single field inflation uh, is that uh, basically uh, the distance conjecture um, uh, constrains the field space um, uh, for which any eft will be applicable and the data and the refined data conjecture is set constraints on, on the potentials uh, so uh, uh, so one uh, central point of contract which is uh, observable is that the data conjecture is in stark agreement with the with the condition of the epsilon slow parameter being very less than one. This is epsilon in the GR based cosmology. Uh, the uh, another issue is that there would not be sufficient number of e folds as as del phi um, um, uh, is equal to uh, v prime by v um, in the very approximate case. Uh, uh, so obviously for the conjectures it, it will be less than one which is something which we would not need and they would uh, and the definitions of the conjecture are not consistent with the data on single field inflation in gr based case and now if you apply the exact solution approach um, uh, on inflation and try to study uh, inflation in, in general cosmologies which are allowed by the approach we see that it, that that it is only the f equal to h squared case which is for, for gr that that there are stark problems with the conjectures as you can see that that we were that v prime by v uh, can be greater than one and still we can have uh, epsilon which uh, to be less than one in the gr case uh, uh, we get this relation between the spectral index uh, and the conjecture parameters which leads uh, to, to lower orders uh, of the conjecture parameters from their uh, string theoretic definitions uh, but but in general cosmologies uh, uh, we get this relation uh, and again uh, it is only for f equal to h squared that we are having star conflicts uh, um, um, the string theoretic definitions of the parameters uh, can be made consistent um, and we can still have uh, appropriate values of, of the spectral index. And finally, we can we can also have enough amount of, of inflation, as as one can see uh, that uh, that we can fine tune the free parameters of the model, n not the physical quantities like the energy scale or stuff like that. Uh, we can fine tune the free parameters of the model um, and can have enough amount of inflation as well. So uh, so I would like to end here um, and. Uh, 
uh, and basically uh, the conclusion of, of, of this whole thing is that in general cosmological scenarios inflation uh, single field inflation and the swamp and conjectures are not in uh, unavoidable contracts with with each other all right thank you for the very interesting flash talk then um, the last speaker on the list is um, Benjamin Giblin Hi, I'm Benjamin Giblin, a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. In this flash talk, I'm going to be discussing KIDS 1000, the latest data release from the Kilo Degree Survey. KIDS 1000 is a catalogue of red shifts and galaxy shape distortions, or shear, measured from 21 million galaxies. These galaxies span 1006 square degrees on the sky. You can see the footprint of the survey depicted above the VLT survey telescope here. This is the telescope used to observe these images. KIDS 1000 was recently discussed in a bunch of papers on the archive, but in this flash talk I'm focusing on work in my own paper, Giblin et al, in which we performed the robustness tests of the shear and redshift calibrations. More specifically, I'm going to focus on the PSF modeling. There's many ways in which errors in the PSF modeling can lead to bias on your constraints on cosmological parameters. The biases might come from mismeasurement of the PSF shape and size. It could come from imperfect deconvolution of the PSF from your imaging. The way in which you choose the objects for your PSF modeling and the noise in the imaging of those objects can be problematic. But the effect that we found to be most significant comes from instrumental defects. This can give rise to a flux dependence in your PSF modeling errors that can vary from CCD to CCD in your camera. Here I'm showing a one square degree image in the R band taken by our telescope. There are two CCDs that are highlighted by the red squares that we found to have particularly strong flux dependence in the PSF modeling errors. So we propagated those PSF modeling errors into a bias on the measurement we use to constrain cosmological parameters. That measurement is a shear correlation function. It's basically a measure of how correlated the galaxy shapes are as a function of their angular separation. Here I'm showing you the biases on that measurement that arise from different sources of imperfect PSF modeling. And the bias that arises from flux dependence in the PSF modeling errors is the magenta term, the one that we find to be most significant in terms of its impact on your cosmological parameter constraints. Fortunately, in the case of this data, the PSF model is sufficiently accurately um, constrained such that this flux dependent bias is still uh, quite small. It induces less than a 0.1 sigma change in our constraints on the clustering parameter S8. So it's fairly benign for KIDS 1000. However, this is definitely something that should be uh, tested and modeled with future upcoming surveys like LSST and Euclid, because typically looking at flux dependence in your PSF modeling is not part of the standard tests for validating your PSF modeling. So that's pretty much the takeaway message. If you have any further questions on KIDS 1000 um, or weak lensing cosmology in general, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Thank you.